tweets I wanted to read out. Brian McSporran does a lot of backing, <laughs> does a lot of backing Anne Stoker on a horse. Well, that's ridiculous. It's unfair. She read a good yes. race when she had that winner at Wolverhampton, the big price. Mm, the nebulous Brian McSporran character mm. I see, still, still at large. Uh, Tom Randall was uh, emailed in as well. He wants to talk about um, uh, staking. He says, uh, I prefer level stakes policy to the Kelly stakes that James mentioned, because with Kelly, you're at the mercy of your bookmaker with regards to accepting your variable stake. Basically, if uh, Kelly dictates a larger stake to be placed on the selection and you get knocked back by your bookmaker, then you've had it, particularly if that bet then uh, compensated for previous losers. Absolutely spot on. An excellent point well made. That's a good point, isn't it? Very good. Tom, Tom Randall. Yeah. Uh, we'll keep the emails uh, and tweets to one side for now. We're going to talk about uh, times, speed, coming up in the final section now. We've got a few examples to have a look at as well. Um, We've picked a race. We've just we picked a race at Royal Ascot, um, the Prince of Wales' six, where Far, of course, uh, uh, ran on, finished off the race well. This was backed up by the, the figures that we that we picked up as well for this. We're going to have a look back at the race as well. This is the race where, of course, uh, Far ran on strongly in the final furlong and uh, recorded some pretty fast uh, furlongs, particularly in the latter half of the race. Is this misleading information? Um, it's it's questionable how much it's worth, but it does show that Far covered the final furlong in just under 12 seconds. Now, first of all, the winner, of course, was So You Think. Um, you can have a look at the, uh, the times there from, from seven furlongs. Now, this is the important one for me. The final furlong he ran from the furlong to the winning post, 11.65 seconds quicker than the winner So You Think, quicker than Carlton House and Reliable Man, who were around him as well in that race. Um, what do those figures show, Hugh? What exactly are they, are they telling us there? Well, the, the problem with this, I'm going to focus on the problems, which is a bit unfortunate because I'm a huge fan of se sectional times, but the problem we have with this is that while it was great to see at, the, at, at so many big meetings that we did have sectional timings, they become much more meaningful if you actually have a database of a large number of times for each, uh, for each distance at a track because you can then make meaningful comparisons and work out what percentage of a horse's final time it should expend over different parts of the race. Um, that's much more difficult to do when you've only got the odd meeting here and there covered. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm not wanting to pour a wet blanket on this or anything because you, even with isolated examples you can still see um, with the way that one horse finishes a race you can get some sort of information but it would be so much better if we had um, a database of accurate sectional times that we could then work out exactly. Uh, trust me, when you look at a, a series, I keep my own sectional times, homemade ones from the old weather tracks, and you soon pick up patterns. I know that at Wolverhampton, say, over six furlongs, if a horse is, does the first four furlongs in 48 seconds, there's very little chance it's going to last out unless it's absolutely exceptional um, or, or the track is riding, riding lightning fast. And you get to learn that very quickly. It's much more difficult when you just get them in isolation. That's an absolutely perfect summary. I don't really have anything to add. I mean, th that's absolutely true and exactly why sectionals haven't taken on in this country. There's no point having them for just the good races, really. Now, in that case, that example does actually tell you something. Um, what you look at when you have sectionals like that, in absence of any other sample sizes, are you, c you can confuse the relative with the absolute. But in the case of Far, you actually ran that last furlong, which is partly uphill, as I remember. Um, faster than nearly any other horse did any other section of the race. Mm. So there's probably enough there to say that he wasn't running on through a slow section of the race, but he was running on through a, the hottest part of the race, and his effort was a very good one. Far's problem as a racehorse was his soundness, in my opinion. I mean, he just was bandaged later on in the season. He, didn't, he moved worse and worse as the season went on. Mm. But I think he had an awful lot of ability as the Eclipse proved. I think he should have won the Eclipse uh, subsequently as well. Yep. A horse who perhaps didn't quite get the um, the rewards his, his, his talent deserved. And what about um, going back to the times? We've got some other times for you as well from day one of, uh, of Royal Ascot. And um, this is an example that we've that we picked up here, as you can see. Frankel, um, his his time when he won the Queen Anne over the straight mile was uh, 1.15 seconds quicker than standard. Little Bridge in the five furlong race, uh, 0 0.09 seconds slower. Most improved in the St James's Palace Stakes, 0.14 seconds slower. Dawn Approach. Slower as well there in the Coventry. It's, it's a good point about two-year-olds, isn't it? Expecting two-year-olds to do slower times than, than their elders. Right, well, this is more basic, and this is something I think that at the races should do every day. We've heard from some of our viewers today how sophisticated they are in their analysis of racing. The simple information of how fast or slow horses run compared to a benchmark for the course and distance is fundamental and to appreciating not just racehorse merit but pace as well. 
And to get the full appreciation of that, you need another column, which is seconds over or under standard per 100 seconds of the race, or per furlong as it's done less accurately in some parts. And that standardizes all races according over various distances. So you can compare a five furlong race of Little Bridge with say the two mile four furlong Ascot stakes. And I think presenting that information at the end of the day, when there's time to do it and, it, and there isn't anything else going on, gives the punter an instant reference as to what went on as far as the final times are concerned. It's then up to the punter, as you've already pointed out, Enzo, to differentiate between expect expected times, mm. those, of, those of two year olds or fillies or lower class horses, with those who, you could, who, who should have run faster, like better horses or sprinters, or, and those on fast ground with those on soft ground. So it's only one part of the picture, but it's essential information. Okay, Hugh, I know you obviously you, you do your own speed ratings. Obviously, going allowance is something to factor in as well, isn't it? I mean, at certain track, I mean, Southern was a good example. Obviously, not racing at the moment on the fibre sand, which is a shame. But I know it's a track that you like to specialise in during the, the winter months normally. Well, Southern's a, a really straightforward track if you're doing your own speed. I only do my own speed ratings on the all weather, and it's, it's a really straightforward track. For a start, because the nature of the racing is just jump out and go you don't get many falsely run races and therefore it's probably that little bit easier to get an accurate going allowance and because you don't get things like um, not just falsely run races you don't get much trouble in running mm. the form in terms of speed figures works out exceptionally well uh, probably on the par I've never uh, I've never been a student of American racing but it's a similar yeah, kind of principle it it's the, the, the races are running the same way whereas that's not necessarily yeah. the case on polytrack um, sure. So, just going back to what James was saying about um, the times, the, the, the point he made about showing them at the end of the day is qu quite right, but it can also be a useful guide oh, yeah. um, during the course of the day to what the actual going is. You obviously need to be aware of the possibility of falsely run races and, and wind and things like that, but sometimes even after a couple of races, provided that they're, if, uh, you've got to make sure you look at the class of the race and the age group as well, but you can get sometimes a guide to when the official going yeah. might perhaps be wrong as well. So um, that's, a, that's another Place where I think there are many dubious conclusions drawn on racing television every day about that though that's the problem with that you could do it but some of the people mm -hmm. who, who do do it do it wrong and you're better off not having it at all because expectation yeah. between the various classes of horses and the various sort of round of it's just a, it's not a straightforward thing to do without the whole picture at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah I agree but then, but then the, the alternatives we get at the moment tend to be where the winning jockey comes in and says it's good ground and the, the the jockey who finished his tail off says it's but I prefer that the soft side. I prefer that to someone making a bogus conclusion and saying yeah, that 0 to 60 was three seconds mm. over so it's soft ground. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. probably good to you have You have to be looking yeah. at, the, at the class of the race yeah. and you have to be aware of things like the pace on, of the yeah. race and, and, and wind and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, you spot okay. on. We'll just take a